we're going to have to do the hard work of heart work and love people not where we think they should be, but love them where we actually find them because that's the way God loved us. God didn't love you after he fixed you. God loved you when you were dead in your sin. So people who have been raised to life in Jesus are going to have to love people who are dead in their sin the same way we allow God to love us in our sin. Everybody go with me to Philippians chapter 2. Love the Word of God. Thankful for the Word of God. Super thankful for the Word of God today. Uh, The Word, the Word, the Bible, the Scriptures, this is what's going to actually change your life. And if if you don't get into this, then your mind never gets renewed. Your mind stays broken. Your mind stays saturated uh, with the world. And there is a culture that is in this world that you're called, you're called to change. You're called to address the culture. You are, a cold, you are called to, uh, to change the culture. You don't have to figure it out. All you have to do is be who Jesus intends you to be, and he will do the work of changing culture. You don't have to change people. You don't have to change the government. Um, You can't even change yourself. But if you will focus in on depending on God and becoming who God intends for you to become, here's what's going to happen. God will change the world as he's changing you. And sometimes we get overwhelmed because, you know, the world is a big place and there's a lot of people and there's a lot of craziness. And so we think, you know, I can't change all this. You can't. You can't. You're right. But you don't have to. What you do have to do is don't lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. you got to trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And I'm just telling you, (laughs) preaching is so easy If people will just get, preaching is so easy, if people will just get love God and love people. And some of you are like, I know we've heard you say that before. You know, when are you going to preach something new? Well, when are you going to get this? And when you get this, then we could move on to something new. But until, and 1 John says, and we're not going to go there yet, but 1 John says that if we don't love our brothers who we have seen, how can we love God who we have not seen? And everything hangs on number one and number two. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. Now, listen, I'm not joking. It sounds, it sounds like comedy. But I'm telling you, if you do those two things, you are well on your way to doing all the things God intends for you to do. The moment that you veer out of loving God and loving people, the moment, listen to this, the moment that your, your relationship with God turns to religion, it turns to paste. The moment that your religion turns from, turns from loving God, responding, the scripture says in 1 John that he loved us first. And now our love to him is a response to his love for us. Now, if you don't get that, family, I'm just telling you, your, 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 your experience with God is going to be a dry, dead, stagnant, ineffective, religious experience. This is a love thing. This is a love relationship. And the enemy is doing his best every day to get you to fall out of love with God. He wants you every single day of your life to make this just, think about, for those of you who, no, nah, because everybody's not married, uh, how, how many married people are in the room? You sound happy, and that's good too. I'm glad to hear about that. How many single people are in the room? Let me hear from you. Way, way happier, for sure. So let me just say... I don't even know where I was going at this point. Can you imagine your relationships without love? Can you imagine your relationships without love? It's so simple. And it's, it's, it's obvious. It's right in front of our face. But 
church without love is a farce. It is a, it is a joke. And I'm not saying people don't try it. In fact, I'm telling you that is one of the devil's main strategies is to get you to do church and to ignore the kingdom. Now, the moment that you go to the kingdom, seek first the king. You don't seek the church first. You don't seek your flavor of ministry first or your flavor of doctrine for that matter first. The first thing you want to do is you want to receive the love of God. God loves you. Listen, this is deep theology. All right, this is going to help somebody. God loves you. Love them back. And the moment that you turn it into something else, like your performance for God, you ruin it. The moment it's no longer about loving him, and there's no way for you to love the people around you. Because I'm telling you, if you don't love God, there's no way for you to truly love the people that God puts in your life. Because at some point, you're going to want to quit. And it's the power of God working within you that's going to help you love the people that are not lovable or you're not a loving person. I don't know. Has anybody ever been there? So I want to I lay, lay a foundation that everything I'm going to say Everything I'm going to say, I want you to get this. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Fall in love with God. Fall in love with him. There is no one who's ever loved you more than God himself. No one. No one has ever shown you more love than God himself. I'm telling you, it's just an absolute fact. Y'all got it? Yeah, I figure you do. Okay, so look, here, I think that's my sign to move forward. Let, let me... Let me help y'all with something. I saw something this week with artificial intelligence that I thought was interesting. And I, by the way, I didn't see it. So what picture did you see? God help us. Would you not get ahead of me again, please? How am I supposed to preach? All right. So here's what I'm going to do. I want to show you random pictures from artificial intelligence. These are pictures that artificial intelligence gave to us and they are pictures that basically artificial intelligence was asked, what do Europeans think people from various uh, United States states look like? Y'all with me? So the question was to artificial intelligence, the, the, the direction was to artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is supposed to draw its rendition of what Europeans think Americans from each state look like. Wow. Are you with me? So here is what AI says Europeans think we look like. Now, I want to say... If this offends some of you, I literally don't care. I literally don't care. Don't email me. Grow up too bad. All right. So let's just take a look at some. This is what AI says. Anybody from Arkansas? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. All right. This is what AI says. Anybody from Alaska? This is what AS, AI says people from Alaska look like. Uh, this is Louisiana. Now hang out right there for just a second. Why? I mean, all the food, does that look like Bourbon Street to y'all? All right, let's keep going. Why? Why? This is. <laughs> Don't leave this. This is good. I, I don't know. I don't know why. But this is what artificial intelligence says Europeans think people from Michigan look like. All right, let's keep going. Uh, North Dakota. North Dakota and South Dakota are actually very, very similar. I don't understand this, but for whatever reason, that's what it's saying. Let's keep going. Uh, this is, now, this one made me laugh. This one makes me laugh. Y'all help me. Y'all help me. True or not true? Everybody who ha says true, lift your hand. All right. Everybody who says not true, you're from Massachusetts. All right. 
Now this, that one right there is, is freakish, freakishly accurate. Um, actually, I don't know that that's true. I just, it's funny. All right, let's keep going. I don't know why, but artificial intelligence thinks that people from Colorado are viewed by Europeans this way. Are any of these, are any of these accurate to you at all? Kind of. All right, let's, let's, could y'all see some more? Would you be okay with seeing some more? Now this one, I, this one I really like because this guy's having church. Y'all see that? Do you see, do you see the church pews? Now I'm going to tell you, artificial intelligence has never been more creepy to me. Y'all see the shoes, you see legs, but you don't see nobody. I guess somebody was running over the pews and fell over the back. <laughs> y'all see that? And the shoes are two different shoes. Do y'all see that right there? Now, can I tell y'all? I, hey, y'all don't know this. Some of y'all don't know this. I grew up in a church where people ran. Don't, don't even get me started. I'll outrun. If I get into spirit, I'll outrun anyone. I'll, I will outrun I will, never mind, I'll just outrun you. If I get in the spirit, if I get in the spirit, this, this is like, there's pews. This is, it's just weird. Look at his hand. You see his left hand? I don't understand. I don't, under, I don't understand. I want to say this before we move further with these pictures. Uh, I'm not saying, let me say it this way. Artificial intelligence has never been creepier to me. It is so creepy to me. And I'm not saying that it's the devil. I'm saying that we don't understand it. And I'm saying there's never been a time where we needed to be people of prayer more. We need to find the deepest place of prayer to figure out how to move forward, uh, how to move forward with, with this world that we live in. This is what Europeans think people from Mississippi look like. And the dude's having church, so I wouldn't mind being from Mississippi right here. Look at all the people lifting their hands, <laughs> praising the Lord. Uh, now, I don't know, that's a weird-looking foot hand behind his right shoulder. I don't know if that's like, I don't know what that is. I don't know. But uh, how many agree that AI seems kind of creepy? I don't understand. All right, let's keep going. Uh, this is Indiana. <laughs> Anybody in the room from Indiana? I can't wait to show y'all Utah. Utah is going to be real fun. I hope to God they can put Utah up. All right, let's, let's keep going. New Jersey. <laughs> Anybody from New Jersey, not ashamed to lift your hands up. All right. Only people from New Jersey vote. Is this accurate? Yes. yes. That's hilarious. All right, let's keep going. These are California. That is funny. Oh, my gosh. Do you see the branding on the coffee mugs? That's what's interesting because, you know, I mean, AI is really interesting. It's really interesting what it comes up with, and it won't just create, you know, a coffee mug. It will create the branding that goes on the coffee mug. Now, I'm not saying this is the mark of the beast, but I am saying you better learn to pray because this is creepy. I don't understand. All right, let's keep going. This is uh, West Virginia. <laughs> Does that surprise anybody? All right, let's, let's keep <laughs> What is he doing? This is Montana. I'm surprised they didn't put uh, Kanye West on the horse right here. That would have made sense to me, although I think he's selling his ranch right now. All right, let's keep going. Uh, this is South. I told you South and North Dakota look pretty similar. And uh, how interesting, how interesting. This is what AI thinks Europeans would view these people from these states as. Let's keep going. Uh, Texas. I was hoping to God that they would put Texas up there. Anybody from Texas? Is this accurate? No. Okay. No. Hey, 
Don't make the people from Texas mad because they all have ARs in their pockets. So let's not, let's not make them mad. All right, Washington. I don't, I don't know. I don't understand. I don't understand. Huh? Okay, I still don't understand. All right, so let's keep this Oklahoma. What's up with the mustache? I, I don't, is it the Wizard of Oz? Is it, I, I don't, is there a, 1800s? It's just weird. Uh, trains, the brakes, I don't know. Anyways, let's keep going. Uh, New Hampshire. <laughs> Anybody from New Hampshire? All right, let's keep going. And what are they eating? What are they eating? And are they dating? What is up with this? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> That's weird. I'm trying, but I don't understand it. I don't know that anybody can get it right. I don't understand this. Let's keep going. This is uh, Missouri. Now, I'm going to assume that it's Missouri because this is like barbecue. But I have no desire to eat whatever that is. I just want to. And I like barbecue. But that looks like a blown up alien. I don't know what that is. All right, let's keep going. Let's get this. Is Oregon. Does that make sense? Oregon, yes. Anybody here from Oregon? Anybody from Oregon? Nobody? One. We got one person from. Oh, she's not. Okay, so. All right, let's keep going. This one, this one, where's, where's Pastor Austin is what I want to know. <laughs> how many, how many think that's accurate? Okay, that was not very nice of y'all. Let's, let's keep going. This is Vermont. Vermont. Accurate or not? Okay. Let's keep going. This is Kansas. I don't understand this one either. How weird is that? Hey, look, can y'all handle a few more of these? Is that all right? A few more? All right, let's keep going. Let's get Georgia. Now, that one actually makes sense because he's growing peaches, right? Okay, uh, he looks maybe like a country boy. New York? Does that make sense? Okay, that's, I have thoughts on all these, but I'm just refraining. Tennessee. That's scary looking. That's scary. That's, that's Pastor Tony's cousin up there, I just want to say. That's, is that accurate? No, it's not accurate. Okay, South Carolina. That, that, that looks interesting to me. All right, let's keep going. Uh, this one is freakishly accurate. How many are from North Carolina? North and South Carolina, they wear these khaki pants. Often they're pink. Pink pants. Or plaid. But yeah, that's actually, that, I feel like I'm in North Carolina right now. All right, we're going to speed through these. There's a couple. Wyoming makes sense. He looks like a movie actor. All right. Go ahead, Connecticut. Wow. Okay, go ahead, Kentucky. That's funny. I don't care what anybody says. That's, that's funny. All right, Utah, here we go. Finally made it to Utah. Can you just hold that up for two seconds? Um, so... That's weird, y'all. And, but, but anyone from AI is saying that people from Europe would go to Utah and expect people to, to look like this because of all the Mormons in Utah. Does that make sense? So there's an assumption that we can make. I'm not saying this is accurate. It's, again, don't email me. I don't care. But this is, this is what Artificial intelligence says people from uh, Europe are going to think people from Utah look like. All right, a couple more, and then, uh, so I don't know what's up with Pennsylvania. I don't understand this one. Is Pennsylvania known for chocolate? First of all, 
Is that a chocolate bar? I'm just saying, I hope to God that's what it is. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, Rhode Island. All right. Iowa. You know, there's one. Idaho is real funny, but let's keep going because I'm, I'm running out of time. Let's keep going. Nebraska. Nebraska. Let's go with Wisconsin. <laughs> They're cheeseheads, right? Wisconsin, cheeseheads. Okay, there's Idaho. <laughs> that's, that's funny. All right, let's keep going. Maine. I've been to Maine. It's a beautiful place, interesting place. All right. Uh, Nevada. Does that make sense? All right, let's keep going. Virginia. It's about 250 years old. Okay, the, unless they're vampires. This is Ohio. Anybody from Ohio offended by this? We were trying. Okay. All right, let's keep going. Delaware. We're coming up. Okay, well, anyways, we're done with this. We're done. Y'all done? Y'all good? No, no, no. Y'all don't care about knowing about Florida. Wait, wait, wait. You're telling me you want to know what, what Florida looks like? Okay, well, we'll keep going. Here's Hawaii. Here is, uh, let's see here. Here's New Mexico. <laughs> this is New Mexico. <laughs> Aliens. All right, let's keep going. Washington. Uh, I think I might have uh, put two of them on there. Okay, so uh, there's Florida. <laughs> Leave that up. Everybody from Florida says, not accurate. <clears throat> wow. So here, here's a question. These people, these people, artificial intelligence basically says that it thinks that people from Europe think people from the various states look like what you saw. And artificial intelligence is taking the information that it's been fed. It's been fed information. It didn't just, artificial intelligence, it's artificial. It's an intelligence that is artificial. It didn't just make this up. Someone had to program it. I want to I point something out because if you, if you're a Christian and you don't have a prayer life, you are not helping. And I, I love you. I'm not mad at you. I care about you. You're important to me. I'm telling you, there is no, there is no existence that we as believers in Jesus can accept apart from a prayer life on fire. A prayer life where we are praying and seeking the face of God with all of our heart. Where we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And it is evidenced by a prayer life that seeks his face. That wants to know him. That doesn't just ask God for things, but recognizes a deep inner need for a relationship with the God of the universe. And he's the God of beyond the universe too, but just the part that we can see, just the part that we know, he is the God over all of that. He's king over all of that. He's not gonna be voted on. Nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna take him out of office. He is there to stay. And that is who we have to communicate with in prayer. Communicate meaning you're not gonna do all the talking, but you're gonna let him speak. And some people are like, well, I don't know how to hear the voice of God. This is the voice of God. So what happens is, is if you want to hear the voice of God, you get in this book. And as you get in the book, you will learn to recognize the voice of God. Because the voice of God is never going to be contrary to what's in this book. If, if, if when you say, I can't hear the voice of God, what that's saying is you need to spend more time right here. Because God's word, and I've said this 10,000 times, and I'm going to keep saying it, God's voice is not, first of all, God's voice is more discerned than heard. You discern the voice of God more than you hear the voice of God. 
And I want you to understand it because there's a lot of voices in your life vying for your attention. A lot of people who want to tell you what to do and where to go and how long to stay and who to go with. But I'm telling you, God's voice is discerned in context. It's not timber. It's not pitch. It's not volume. It doesn't sound like a Steven Spielberg movie. And oftentimes, often, God's voice is a whisper in your life. See, God's not so insecure. He's got a scream in your ear. God will whisper to you. The most powerful leaders in the world understand the strength of their whisper. See, when someone comes in and has to pound the table all the time and scream and yell, that's not a strong, confident leader. Strong leaders can come in and whisper to their teams when necessary. And so I want to say that we've got to get in this book. We've got to familiarize ourselves with it. And here's what this book is. This book is soap for your soul. It's soap for your brain. I don't have time to get into it, but we've talked about the soap method of, of Bible study. But when you get in the scripture, what's going to happen is it's going to scrub your brain of all the, the stupid stuff that the devil's trying to throw into it all the time. And you have a calling from God, and this is the only hope you have of actually figuring out what it is. Yes. It's getting in this. We live in a very, very weird world. Now, Here's a question that I have, and I I want to be careful here because people can take this to such extremes, uh, really unnecessary and and actually unbeneficial extremes. But if AI is, if artificial intelligence uh, has been created in this world, if artificial intelligence, it's artificial, it's, it's not necessarily intelligence, Not necessarily, if you want intelligence, you're going to have to look to the stars. You're going to have to look to God. I don't mean astrology. I mean the the creator of everything. You're going to have to look to the one who creates, because he's the only one who can create things with order. But artificial intelligence is just that. It's artificial. It's not necessarily intelligent. And it's been created in a world. I just want you to think what this might mean. It's been created in a world whose ruler is Satan. Now, what what are the implications of an intelligence that has created, Paul said, Satan is the God of this world. Jesus said, Satan is the ruler of this world. If you you think for one second that you can forget thrive, even survive in a world that is ruled by the devil and ignore the God who saves you from the devil, you've lost your mind. And there's, there's groups, there's different groups of people here. Not everybody here today is a believer in Jesus. I understand that. I hope you understand. Trust me, I get it. I have to remind myself, but I hope you understand that everybody in this room today is not a believer in Jesus. Like there's people, by the way, there's people in the room who think they're believers in Jesus and may not be believers in Jesus. People who just have a religious experience but never actually trusted God to save them from their sins. They just took on a form of godliness, but they've denied all the power. Now I want to, I want you to understand. There's there's a couple groups of people. There's saved people in the room, and then there's some some strong Christians. There's some baby Christians, and then also there's some non Christians in the room right now. And what I'm preaching to you today, if you're a Christian, you're going to understand, oh, wow, I need to take this serious. I'm in a world that's ruled by Satan. So I understand that. I need Jesus in my life, no doubt. I want the Spirit of God to empower me, no doubt. I need to read what God says so I can be empowered in this world. i got to scrub my mind. i got to scrub my emotions with the Word of God. I need the Word of God to sanctify. I need uh, the Word of God to clean up my thoughts. I need the word of God to clean up my emotions. You know all your emotions are not from God. You know, some of the emotions that you're dealing with, the devil's stirring some of y'all up. And you're offended at people who you have no right to be offended at. You're just angry and unforgiving. And the word of God is going to fix that. When you, when you read the word, you're going to scrub your brain. You're going to scrub your, your, your emotions of all of that. And so... This world that is ruled by the enemy as a believer in Jesus, 
then you want to understand the gravity of this. If you're here and you're not a believer in Jesus, here's good news for you. You don't have to just take a walk through this life and just experience whatever happens to you. Because when you become a Christ follower, you actually become part of a plan that you don't just experience what happens to you, you actually get on purpose. You begin to live with a call from God. Somebody recently said to me on social media that, uh, that our lives should be a ministry. Exactly. That's what we're trying to say. Paul says we're living epistles. Like our lives are a message to the world. And that's what we're trying to help people understand is that you have a call from God. Now, this past week, this past week, and I think it was Pennsylvania, um, a suspect, a murder and rapist suspect escaped from prison. Did anybody see this? He escaped and he was gone. He was gone for like nine days. I don't know all the details on it, but I read just enough to know that he went through the gym at the jail, went out through a window. He tied a bunch of bed sheets together and let himself down put on a jean jacket that he got from somebody over his jail attire and ran off into the night. He had campsites. Uh, he, he, he had campsites where he had stayed during that time. And you know how they finally found him? Because they knew what he looked like. Once they knew what he looked like, they plaster his picture everywhere. And once they knew what he looked like, and they know they also, they, well, let me just go there. They knew what he looked like they were able to secure his position and they apprehended him. Thank God that they did. But at any rate, it made me think, if you as a Christian were put in jail for being a Christian, and let me just say, I hope it never comes to that. But if it did, I wonder how many people in this church would still be a Christian. But if you were a Christian and you were put in jail and you escaped, if the world was looking for you, would you look enough like a Christian for them to recognize you when they found you? We need to ask these questions. And I want, I want, to, help, I want to help you today because I want to show you what a picture of it's going to look like. All right, here we go. This is Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Have this attitude, oh, let this mind be in you. This is the King James. I'm reading from the NASB. Let's read it out loud from the King James Version. I love this first phrase from the King James, and that's why we're reading it. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let, read it out loud. 3, 2, 1. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Uh, just so everybody, let's read, let's read verses 5 through 8. Five through eight. Let's read this together. Who, being in the form of God, read with me, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of, and the form of a servant, and was made in the, all right, this is Jesus, born of a, who lived the perfect sinless, who died on the, for all of ours, and rose from the, and he's coming back. In the likeness of men, in verse 8, this is critical, everybody read this, and being found in the fashion as a man, he what? He what? Say it again, he. And became obedient, even the death. Now I want you to understand that when you humble yourself, you humble yourself for a purpose. There is a reason that you humble yourself. And Jesus, who is wrapped in splendor, sitting at the right hand of the Father, Jesus, who is eternal backward, Jesus, who, who can't be measured in time, space, and matter, Jesus empties himself to become human on behalf of us who were dead in our trespasses. He had to humble himself to leave his glorious estate to come walk on the earth and have growing fingernails. Jesus never had to cough in heaven. He never had to, he never had to eat something in heaven. But on earth, he humbled himself. So on earth, he had to eat and he had to rest and he had, watch, 
He had to pray. Jesus had to pray. Not praying was not an option for Jesus. He, he had a choice to make and he chose to seek first the kingdom of heaven. Now the scripture says he humbled himself. Listen to me, believers in Jesus. And those of you who are not believers in Jesus, let me help you understand who it is. Not that, listen, oh gosh, I want to say it and I, wanna, I don't want to say it the wrong way. It's who we are. It's not always who we, how we represent who we are. It, this is who we are. Christians look like Christ. Christians are to be Christ-like. So we, whatever Jesus looks like, that's what we are to look like. That means, that means that what you see Jesus doing in the Bible, that you then got to look into your own life and say, how do I do what Jesus did? You say, well, you can't do that. He was Jesus. Well, you can if you read the Bible. Because the scripture says, Jesus, Jesus said, the works that I do will you do. And... Greater works. But by the way, you ain't ready for greater works. Raise somebody from the dead and then talk to me about greater works. Heal somebody, heal somebody of cancer and then, and then talk to me about greater works. Right now, let's just get to the works that Jesus did. How about we start with loving people? Loving people, caring about people. How about this? We start with humbling our hearts. I'm telling you that if you were, if you were a, a Christian fugitive and they were trying to find you and the only reason, the only way they knew, the only characteristic that they had in order to find you was uh, being a Christian, then they would be looking for someone who had a humbled heart. This is who we're supposed to be. Now, I want you to understand that if, if you're going to, if you're going to make a difference in this world for God, it will only happen because you did the hard work of heart work and you got rid of your pride and you exchanged your pride for humility. We need to exchange pride for humility. See, pride is the thing where the devil says, I will exalt myself. I, I, I will be like the most high. Satan makes five I will statements in the Old Testament. And what he's wanting to do is he's wanting to unseat God as the authority of the kingdom. Satan says, I will be like him. Satan says, I'm going to. In fact, that's what the devil did, by the way, in the Old Testament when he looked at Adam and Eve. And he said, in the day that you eat of this tree, God knows that you will be like him. Satan actually got humanity to believe the lie that got him booted out of heaven. And so now, see, you say, well, aren't we supposed to be like God? We're supposed to be like Jesus. And Jesus was constantly dependent upon the Father. Jesus said, my thoughts are not my own thoughts. I don't do anything of my own initiative. Whatever works I see the Father doing, that's what I do. Whatever I hear the Father say, that's what I say. Jesus modeled for us the relationship we're supposed to have with the creator of the universe. And that is one of humble dependence. But what we want is independence. We want our own way and we want to be the boss. This is why Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Because, because if you don't have, the, and does everybody know what the kingdom is? What is the kingdom? God's governance. God's righteous reign. One of my favorite words to describe the kingdom is God's rule. So in other words, when you say you seek the kingdom, you know what you're saying? You're saying, God, I want you to rule me. Well, if you haven't humbled your heart, he doesn't rule you yet. If you don't, if I'm talking about daily, a daily thing where every day of your life, you're saying, God, I, I want to humble my heart. And he, here's, here's the difference between humility and pride. Pride is when you do what you want to do, the way you want to do it, how you want it, when you want it, with who. Pride is you decide What's the right thing to do? Humility is God will tell me in his word by the Holy Spirit, God will show me what to think. See, there's, there's, uh, man, I didn't know this would be a two-part thing, but this is part of what it's going to be. So we got to humble our heart. Jesus humbled his heart. 
And the scripture says, the, and so I'm going to go back to verse 3 and 4. This is going to give you a picture of it in your life. Because some of you are like, okay, great, i got to humble my heart. What's it look like? Okay, well, I'm glad you asked. I'll tell you. The scripture says, and this is in the NASB, therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, and there is, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, uh, he says, make my joy complete by being of the same mind. What mind did he talk about just a few minutes later? It's a humble mind. Come on, we got to humble our hearts. We are called to humility. You will, I'm telling you, I don't care what it is you do, you will not succeed in it in the kingdom without a humble spirit. You're going to have to humble your heart and say, God, I don't want what I want. I want what you want. You're smarter than I am. You're wiser than I am. You're stronger than I am. He says, maintaining the same what? Oh, isn't that interesting? He says, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. I want to say this. Love is the key to unity in the spirit. If we don't love what Jesus said, the world won't even know that we're his disciples unless we love one another. And then it's also interesting to know that I think this is a, this is a the love is also, uh, the love test is also good for God, to, to God knowing where we're at. Because if we don't love people who we have seen, how can we love God whom we've not seen? And so God is watching whether or not you love the people in your lives. See, it takes humility to love your wife like Christ loved the church when your wife closed down the promised land for the last six months. You don't scare me, I promise. It takes, it takes love to honor your husband when he hasn't touched you on the shoulder in two years. When your husband hasn't spoke a word of affirmation of, over you, but yet you still got to honor him in your house. It takes love for God to love your husband that way, giving him the respect that God wired him to need. That takes love. It takes love. See, we're going to be going into a political season where the church uh, at 3550 O'Galley Boulevard, Discover Life, is going to shine bright in this coming season. Glory to God. I'm speaking life over this. You're going to shine during this season. You know what's going to make us shine for the Lord? We're going to love people. We're going to love people where they are. We're going to love people even when we don't understand them. We're going to humble our heart and say, God, I pity them enough to love them where they are. Even if I disagree with them politically, I need to love that person. I don't, you know, here's what the Lord spoke to me one time when I wasn't loving my wife. One time when I was not loving my wife, the, this is what the Lord said to me. Who are you not to love the daughter that I have that I gave into your life? You have no right to mistreat her just because you're angry at her. I'm speaking to husbands right now. You have no right to mistreat her. She's my daughter. She's mine, God says. And now I, and now I have to humble my heart. I don't know if I, I don't know if I mentioned this to y'all. It's not, I mean, it's not like a big thing or anything, but but this year is gonna be like 30 years for my wife and I. What's the date? Yeah, I mean it's it's it's, it's tomorrow, but I mean, you know, it's it's whatever. It's whatever. No, you know what? Then the Lord got on to me because now I have to humble my heart and do something I don't want to do because God said do it and he knows better than I know. You don't get to 30 years without making decisions like that more than once. Very, very rarely. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as? I know nobody's excited about that. Nobody's excited about that. You know what that takes, family? That takes humility. It takes humbling your heart for me to view you as more important than me. Now, here's what's, this is what's my default. My default is I'm way more important than you are. I don't care where you eat lunch today. I don't care. Eat wherever you want. I'm going to eat where I want. I, I want to go where I want to go. I won't be calling you to ask your opinion. Hey, I'm hungry. Would you tell me where you think I should go eat? I don't care what you think. 
I'm going to go eat. If I want donuts, I'm going to go get donuts. If I want a cheeseburger, I'm going to go get a cheeseburger. I'm not going to call you and ask you, hey, you know, I've been thinking about this, and my family and I want to have a wonderful dinner together today after church. And we just, we all sat together and prayed, and we thought it would be a really good idea if we called you and asked your expert opinion about where we're going to go eat. How many know that's not happening today? Why? I don't care what you think. I want to eat. I don't care what you like. I don't care what, I don't care if you like sweet tea or Coke or water or Kool-Aid, <laughs> 1982. I don't care. You know why? I have an idea of what I want. But humility says, humility of mind says that I'm going to regard others as more important than myself. I have a question before I go any farther real fast. How many in here today are, are having... Uh, How many here today are hearing this Bible verse for the very first time? Lift your hands if you're hearing this. Hold them up high. Hold them up high. Please do this. Thank you. Thank you. Is is it surprising to any of you that you would hear this in Scripture? And and by the way, those of you who are believers in Jesus need to really look around the room. Hey, guys, I appreciate y'all. Don't you dare come out right now. So (laughs) I want y'all just, this this is humility of mind. This is humility of mind. Hold on. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. I'm going to have to come back and preach part two of this. When, when you have... Let me, let, let, let me just... Let me just Let me close this out. You have chance at a at a at a drag march. We're here. We're come on. Don't act like you don't know it. We're here. We're and we're. You're afraid to say we're here. We're queer and we're coming for your children. Uh Anybody ever? Anybody hear, hear hear that? We're here, we're queer, and we're coming from... Hold on, before you say anything, because I just, I, just, I just turned the apple cart over, and right now people in the room are trying to decide whether or not they're going to stand up and scream. Well, first of all, you're going to sit down is what you're going to do. And, and what we need to do is love the hell out of people. So there's this march... And at, I think it was a drag march. And hold on, I have family members. I have family members who have struggled with homosexuality. So I'll take my liberty. And FYI, there are people in this room who may struggle with same-sex attraction. And there are people. And this past week, I saw this video on YouTube of a transgender child. And it was a video of an eight. Uh, it was a video of an eight-year-old boy. And I'm pretty sure, I think the video is about seven years old. And it was a, a little boy with lipstick, eight years old, dressed as a girl, and he had these postcards that he's showing. And on the postcards, he was telling his life story that how since a child he wanted to play with dolls and he was always doing girly things and this or that or whatever. And I noticed in some of the comments that people would say, oh, you know, my son did that when he was a kid, but you know, he's a wonderful husband today and blah, blah, blah. And there, all this stuff on there. But in one of the postcards, the little boy who's got long, uh, sandy blonde hair with lipstick on, uh, who has mannerisms of a little girl, um, the little boy with the postcards uh, holds up a postcard that says, please tell your children and all your friends. And that's on a postcard. And then the next postcard says, because the, uh, the boy had talked about how some of the kids in his life had bullied him. And some of the kids had said, go kill yourself. One of the kids specifically said to the boy, who th- thinks he's a girl, specifically said to him, Uh, Go kill yourself and nobody will even care when you die. 
Now, that's, that's happening to if he's eight years old at the time that he's given the, the testimony of it on the, on the YouTube thing. Well, then that's probably a year or two before that where someone is telling another, a, one six-year-old is telling another six-year-old or a seven-year-old is telling another seven-year-old, go kill yourself. Well, I promise you that seven-year-old telling another seven-year-old to go kill themselves, they've heard that and learned it from somewhere, and they didn't learn it in Sunday school, I can tell you that. And so, and so this, this kid, this boy, he holds up a postcard, and the postcard says, please tell all your friends, all your, please tell your kids and all your friends, listen to this, it's never okay to bully anyone. Now, it bothers me that an eight-year-old boy confused about his gender has to be the one to tell the message the church should be preaching. And it, it really struck a chord in me that an eight-year-old child has to say what we could say if we'd love the hell out of people all around us. And the story that I was telling you, if you've, if you've seen it, there's a, a march of people and they're basically, and NBC, I think, did a, I have to be careful about saying even NBC because all the Fox people will turn me off the moment I say it's from NBC. But NBC did an article about it and said that they interviewed people and the people said, many people said it was taken out of context. Some people said, well, we're not actually coming after your children. We just, but listen to this. Even people who are not Christians were upset about this saying, man, you've went too far when you start talking about we're coming after your children. And so the thing is, your default when you hear that these people are coming after your children. Let me tell you, they won't get our children at Parkhurst Academy. I can tell you that in the name of Jesus. But when you hear, when you hear that, your default is dumb. Your default is, we got to fight. No, you got to love. You got to love. Your default is, I got to get on so I got to tell somebody. We're not going to put up with this. The, 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 the kingdom suffers violence and the violent taken by force. Oh, no. You need to love. You need to slow down. You need to humble your heart. And you need to find out how would Jesus approach this broken world. I can tell you how. He humbled himself and wrapped himself in flesh. And he came and loved people who spit in his face, ripped out his beard, put a spear through his side, and crucified him on a cross as he looked down and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And it takes humility to love people who you disagree with. There's a lot of stuff in this world that I disagree with, but I have to humble my heart in order to approach those things I disagree with in the right spirit. Are y'all still here? And this is why there's, this is why there's a lot of people in the homosexual community who, who is absolutely church hurt and won't have anything to do with church because homosexuals have been the whipping post for a lot of people in church for a long time. You say, I don't believe that. Okay, well, by the way, we won't pick any other sin. Like, we want to talk about their pride, but not your pride. And I'm telling you, we got to humble our hearts. And so I saw another story where there's a a gay-owned business, and there's pride flags, and a conservative Christian couple moves next door to them, and they have a business. So the the gay-owned business is a restaurant, and then there's the conservative Christian couple moves in next to them and has um, some finance business or whatever it is. And so they are at odds, and they're not getting along, and they one of them puts a trespass against the other. And so now the, the Christians, the Christians, the guy, the husband is seen on video off to the side of their restaurant throwing a rat up near the front porch of the restaurant and then coming around and taking a picture 
of the rat near the front steps of the restaurant. Now, I don't know why he did that. I don't know what was going through his mind. But, and, and let me just say this. How many of you are thankful that everybody in the world won't see everything you've ever done on video? But for whatever reason, for whatever reason, they have that on video. But the way that it's told is, the way that it's told is, well, you know what? Uh, this guy who says he's a Christian is throwing a rat up near their porch. Y'all see, y'all see how this is viewed by the world? Now, how many, how many people in the world do you think that guy loves Jesus? Let me ask the question again. How many people in the world do you think actually think that man loves Jesus throwing the rat up near the porch? Now, listen to me. Please, hold on. Let me rephrase that. I could say it with authority. I want to humble my heart. I could say it with authority and humble my heart. Please, please listen to me. Believers in Jesus we're going to have to do better than that. We're going to have to do the hard work of heart work and love people not where we think they should be, but love them where we actually find them because that's the way God loved us. God didn't love you after he fixed you. God loved you when you were dead in your sin. So people who have been raised to life in Jesus are going to have to love people who are dead in their sin the same way we allow God to love us and our sin. God, please help us. And it's going to take a humble heart to do it. It's going to take a humble heart. We're going to have to humble our hearts. We're going to have to look for opportunities this week, not we have to look for opportunities this week to love the people God places in our lives. God, this is just me right now. This is just me. I'm not praying for them. Not yet. I'm praying for me. Help me, God. <clears throat> Help me as a Christ follower to humble my heart. Help me, God, as the leader of this church, pastor, as an elder, as your child, as your son, God, help me. Help me to love people the way I'm supposed to. God, the devil wants nothing more than to humiliate me. But God, if I'll humble my heart, God, the scripture says you exalt the humble. And God, I'm asking you to do this, God, not so that people will think I'm something incredible. I'm asking you, God, to teach me about real humility and loving people. I'm asking you to teach me this, God, because I want to be effective for you. I'm not building my kingdom. I want to build your kingdom. And God, the only hope that I have of doing that is if I follow the blueprint that you showed us while you were here. And that blueprint means I'm going to have to humble my heart. So God, teach me, Lord. Teach me. You've already shown me. God, by the Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to teach me to humble my heart so that I, I can love people the way I'm called to love them in this world. God, the church has to love one another. Baptists have to love uh, Pentecostals and Pentecostals have to love the AME church and the AME church has to love the Kojic church and the Kojic church has to love the, uh, we got to learn to love each other and we're going to have to humble our heart. God, there's no way for us to love the world the way we're supposed to if we can't even love the redeemed the way we're supposed to. So God, I'm asking you to teach me, teach me how to be the, the pastor that I'm supposed to be the mouthpiece to speak through me, God, I pray. And God, I'm not asking you to give me the words. First and foremost, I want you to give me, speak through my life. Let me live in a way 
that will be uh, an, an encouragement to people to be transformed by your love. Now, all the people in this room, God, I pray for them in the name of Jesus. I pray for every person in this room and every person who's going to watch this online to be transformed by your love. Transform us, God. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for saving us from our sin. And God, now teach us how to be the light in the world that helps love people who haven't yet been saved from their sin. Help us, God. Work through us, God. Make us the people who can shine bright for you in this world that is full of people who are still stuck in their sin. God, help us lead them to you and not push them from you. I pray, God, for every person who attends Discover Life, God, that we would be the people who humble our hearts in love, love for you and love for the people you place in our lives. And God, use us for your kingdom's sake and for your glory. God, we don't, we don't want to mess it up. We want to do what needs to be done. We want to do it the right way in the right spirit. God, teach us to do that. Can anybody else in this room receive that prayer? God, would you please, would you use your own words for the next 30 seconds? God, teach us to behave like Jesus. Teach us to love like Jesus. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. God, teach us to adopt that spirit. Teach us to adopt that humble attitude. God, let this mind be in us, which was in Christ Jesus. Who, even though he thought uh, was came in the light, was in the likeness of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. God, he humbled himself. Teach us, Almighty God, to humble ourselves. In Jesus' name.